and thank you for joining me on another Fortinet Fabric snippet. So today we're going to look at the integration of Fortinac with the FortiGate firewall and how the two can work together to mitigate uh, threats on in an OT, IoT environment. <clears throat> so what I've got here is a fairly common use case, CCTV cameras. Um, so typically the CCTV camera would only ever talk to the NVR and or a viewing station in a knock or sock. But what would happen if a hacker were to replace a CCTV camera with a Raspberry Pi or any IoT device? <clears throat> now you may ask, well, how and why would they do that? Well, the why should be quite obvious. The how is multifold. Let's say, for example, they use social engineering. Uh, to get on board in the cleaning company that is subcontracted to your organization. They come in the middle of the night, uh, they turn over your uh, one of your IoT devices, and guess what will be at the back of one of those IoT devices? It will be the uh, manufacturer, the part code, a serial number, and the MAC address. Now the reason the MAC address, the media access control address, is important here is because many organizations, it, assuming they even have a form of security for their IoT devices, typically default to you uh, using something called the Mac Auth Bypass. Because these headless devices very seldom have any sort of a security supplicant or an 802.1x supplicant, it's easier for them just to use a, a Mac Auth Bypass. And all that is is just a, a list of all the Mac addresses of the known IoT devices on a radio server, uh, when the device connects to the network, the, the switch or the AP sends that, the switch or the AP is what's called a .1x authenticator, sends that to the radio server. If the MAC address um, is within that library of MAC addresses, then the device is put on the network. Uh, some customers don't even do that. They just have a, a VLAN for their OT devices, which is even worse, because whilst a VLAN may segment the OT devices from the rest of the network or the rest of the devices, it's not protecting them from each other. So if one of them gets compromised, there's, there's nothing stopping it, uh, obviously spreading malicious activities to the other devices and even potentially even jumping across to other VLANs. Now, if you're using the MAC auth and somebody obviously turns over the device, finds that MAC address, then guess what? You've basically given them the password to get on your network. But it's even worse than that. So a, a MAC address uh, comprises 12 hexadecimal digits subdivided into 6 by 2, which typically have a, a colon between each one of the groups of two. Now the first three um, pairs are what's called the OUI, Organizational Unique Identifier, and that just outlines who manufactured that, uh, that NIC, the Ethernet NIC or the wireless NIC or whatever the case may be. Now, challenge here is that to keep things simple, when people are doing MAC auth bypass, they don't use the entire MAC addresses, they just use the OUI. So say, for example, you're using, uh, in this case, uh, 40, 40 net cameras, well, the OUI is going to be Fortinet, right? So anything with that first three digits, you're going to say, well, those are all Fortinet cameras. Uh, so we'll just use the OUI. And whenever somebody plugs in a Fortinet camera, the radius device will let it on. But again, if this person with this Raspberry Pi clones just those three characters, then guess what? They're on your network. Now, the next thing that device is going to do is it's going to open up a command and control channel to the hacker to let it, the hacker know that... Um, it's been successful and thereby giving the hacker full two-way communication into your environment. Now, the FortiGate can detect anomalous behavior. It can send that information up to the FortiNAC. The FortiNAC is obviously controlling the network. It knows where every single device is connected. It can then send remediation to the network to take that device off. So, the way uh, in a Fortinac world, Fortinac is not simply a radio server. It has radius capability built into it, but it's a next generation network access control platform. So, we can use the vendor OUI, which is what I'm using here. All right, now just so you'll see in a few instances there, I use vendor OUI. Now, I wouldn't recommend that. It's for the reasons I outlined earlier, it's a really, really bad idea. This is my own home environment. 
I've got many other controls in this environment and uh, you know if if I get compromised one it's unlikely and two they they're not going to get much um, much out of me uh, and I know that's a naive statement to make but I've got a lot of controls and balances in my network Historically, I wouldn't simply use that. I would use DHCP fingerprinting as well for my OT devices, but we give the customer up to 17 different methods here to protect their network device. So, for example, CCTV camera, you could add in OnViv in, in, in addition to vendor OUI. You could add in active NMAP scanning. You could add in DHCP fingerprinting, or you can do all of those together. Fundamentally, what's happening is that the Fortinet, every single time a device connects to the network it is placed into an isolation vlan it's in that vlan that fortinac then goes and interrogates those devices ascertains their security posture and personality and if they match based on these rules then puts them into the network the network is defined by this thing called the role which ultimately translates to an ssid or vlan all right, but the important thing is it's not unlike dot one X, which is just letting things on with no checks and balances after that. We check the devices every single time it connects. So if we move a device from the ground floor to the first floor, it's going to get rescanned. We're going to continuously rescan that device in a duration that is settable by yourself. You see how here I've set five minutes, but to make sure that the personality hasn't changed during the working day, i.e. somebody's plugged something in that shouldn't be there. And then we will dynamically take that device off the network if need be. Now, for the purposes of this demo, I'm going to clone these um, these three um, digits, uh, hexadecimal digits, this OUI, um, which I'm going to place onto my uh, Raspberry Pi. Now, in the interest of time, I've already done that. So if we come down at the bottom here, you can see I've got this device, which is a Raspberry Pi, but you can see there I've cloned the address. So there is those, uh, the OUI, and there's some bogus uh, digits that I put at the end of that. If I come along here, we can see that I've got, uh, these are the interfaces in that Raspberry Pi. This is the interface that I'm using to connect to that device. And this is the one that's connecting to the 40 NAC, or to rather to the network controlled by the 40 NAC. And there is the bogus MAC address there. Okay. Now, note that this is what a Raspberry Pi MAC OUI should look like, B827EB. So just to confirm that I've got connectivity. All right. So that works. Now, if we come across to the 40 gate, what I'm doing here is I've got a policy here that basically says any traffic that the 40 gate sees leaving the network and going to a destination. So here I'm assuming that the hacker resides in Zimbabwe. The only reason I'm using Zimbabwe is because that's where I came from, where I come from rather. And um, yeah, that was the only, only deciding factor. It could be any country in the world, whichever countries you deem um, are the most likely to harbor you know, malicious individuals, well, you can put that there. Now, th this is just an example. This is by no means you limited to doing geographies. Okay, You can have a policy that looks for all sorts of things, a a virus detection, applications. Um, within the applications, we've got specific, we've got over 2,000 OT-specific applications so we can look at deviations in in application um, in, in ot applications any sort of malicious activity going on there we can look at ips signatures that have been triggered any and all the capabilities of the 40 gate can be leveraged for this again i just use this for simplicity now yes you're going to be looking at this red thing here oh look this thing's got a vulnerability it does that's clearly obvious it says there that it's got one the nice thing with the 40 gate and 40 net is that we actively and proactively inform our customers of the fact when there are vulnerabilities the customer that can then click on that and then make an informed decision as to whether or not to take the guidance included within this radio button which will tell you what the vulnerability is and what version of code you should um, you should upgrade to you can also make an assessment as to whether or not 
whatever is affected by that vulnerability is affecting you. In my case, I've viewed this vulnerability. I know it's not affecting me because of the way I've deployed this device. And there are other reasons why I am keeping this on this version of code, right? So yes, I'm uh, fully aware of that. So back to here. So in terms of the SSID, if I come along here and I look at my SSIDs, you can see I've given it a name, Smart Devices, all right? Um, I'm using all uh, consumer-based OT devices in my house, which um, work with WPA2. Um, but typically in an OT world, especially direct Ethernet connected devices, they won't have this option. So they will be forwarded onto the NAC. All right. So here's where we so here the NAC, as I said, has got radius capability. So it's defined as a radius server. So any authentication is going to be sent here. So the MAC address is going to be sent here. Um, and then you can see here I've got dynamic VLAN assessment. Now, remember what I said is that when you plug in a device into the network, it starts off in an isolation VLAN. It then gets moved into the correct VLAN once it's passed. And that's where the dynamic here, even though I've got a single name for the uh, SSID, I don't have to have multiple SSIDs because this dynamic capability here switches the VLANs on the basis of just a single SSID. Right, so let's go along here and I'm going to drive some traffic to Zimbabwe. So I've got it here somewhere. There we go. Okay, so the, the reason I know that's a Zimbabwean IP address is because I've gone and I've looked at their uh, their ranges here and I've just taken one from there. Uh, I'm not saying that that is a bogus address. It's just something I've taken randomly. All right. Now, if I come along here and I look at my logs, I look at my uh, forward traffic, this is the IP address of that device. Okay. And what I can see here is that you can see traffic actually traffic has stopped flowing now, and that is because if I come, there we go, because there's the deny statement there, right? So that traffic to Zimbabwe has now been denied. Oops, not to there. If I come to here and I go to my actual profile devices. Okay, there's my device there, and you can see the IP address has changed. All right, so again, so if we come back here, if I stop that, and I go config WLAN 0, the IP address has changed. It's no longer that, it has now been placed into the isolation VLAN. If we look at the actual network, and we go here, so this is my 40 gate. These are the SSIDs associated with that. So this is SSID 100. This is the one that it was in because it was compliant. It has now been moved to the isolation VLAN. All right, that was its old IP address. This is its new IP address. Now, the basis upon which that was done was via these uh, rules. So the rule here, you can see here, I've said uh, Zim rule. So I give the rule a name, I give it a trigger, whatever's triggered, okay? And the trigger is, let's look at the trigger. The trigger is traffic leaving the 40 gate. It's being forwarded on from the 40 gate. And here the field is looking for destination country and the value is Zimbabwe. Now, this could be threats, as you can see, threat IDs. It could be an antivirus, it could be UTM. So, for example, here I've got one. I'll come back to that for a second. Here I've got one looking for viruses, right? So, type is UTM, Unified Threat Mitigation. Subtype is virus. So, if it sees an alert with a virus, it'll take remedial action. <clears throat> the next thing then is, what do I do with that information, right? So, then I take that, once that's been triggered, and I perform an action, and in this case, it's Zim action. And I look here, the action is to set the host role to isolation. Now, what I've done here is I've said that purely because this is a demo environment and I don't want to forget for the next um, demonstration, is perform a secondary task after five minutes. And that secondary task is to move it back into its original operation uh, VLAN. But you wouldn't do that in a real network. Ideally, you wouldn't have that secondary, or you could do, but it could be doing something else. It could be sending an email. Uh, it could be um, 
you know, moving that to uh, maybe a, um, a another VLAN, which is an operational VLAN, but doesn't have full access other than to specific um, areas of the network. What you would typically do is that you would come along here, <clears throat> you would go off firstly, and you would do a visual inspection of that device, make sure somebody hasn't um, put in a Raspberry Pi. Once you've satisfied yourself that the device is as it should be, then you can reset the host role here. Okay, so um, hopefully that made sense. Hopefully you saw um, the dynamic uh, integration. Um, so the push-pull, just one thing before I go. So all of these devices communicate with each other via something called the Fortinet fabric. All right, so these are all the devices that we can communicate. These are all the uh, parts of the Fortinet fabric that can be integrated with the Forti gate. So if I look at my topology here, you'll see that the Fortinet is part of this. It's just refreshing. So what it's doing is it's building an entire view of the topology. Okay, there we go. So I can see all my devices on the network. I can see what they are. I can see what's an Apple, what's an Android. I've got all this information at my fingertips. But there is the Fortinac um, device. All right, so that is telling me that it's a Fortinac, what its IP address is, what its build number is, and what. And what this does is it has that full way, two way communication. So not only can the Fortinac, Fortigate inform the Fortinac of issues. But the Fortinac can also push information back to the Fortigate. So, for example, if I come to the profiling rules again, you can see here that I actually added this device to IoT, this group called IoT. So if it passes all its checks and it's, it's deemed to be security compliant, it will get, then get that tag. Now I can use that tag. That tag is then pushed to the Fortigate as this tag a status tag all right now what that basically says is that any device that inherits that tag we can then use that to do other things like populate um, dynamic address objects for example and we can then use that in policies such that devices that are compliant get access to that policy devices that aren't don't all right so um, yeah so this is just another example as you can see that one did have that IoT, it just hasn't been flushed out the container yet. Um, but that was its um, its IP address when it was um, a, a rogue device. Now, in actual fact, while I've been talking, that timer has expired, and this device will now come back online with its original I IP address shortly. But you notice that in this mode here, there's no traffic going out because that device has been isolated. So again, hopefully that was useful. If you've got any questions or queries, uh, either drop me a note via LinkedIn or uh, reach out to your Fortinet SE. Thank you.